getting ready to go back over. But before, we just had an interesting conversation on the break that I had to cut you off. You So JTF2 has not had any casualties? Uh, no. No casualties um, in that. No KIAs. No KIAs, yeah. Killed in action. Yeah. That's... That's unheard of. Oh yeah, it's wild. I mean, and and like I was just saying, like the the sentiment is like we are some lucky motherfuckers. Like there's been guys shot up. There's been real close calls. Like on the first point we were just talking about, like there was a couple times where I'm like, oh fuck. Uh, normally that was mortar fire, but like, yeah, real goddamn close. Um, I mean, ship. When I worked with you guys, the the, the day. I think it was the day we left. Uh, you guys spun up to go out, and a helo got shot down yep. outside of Kandahar. Yeah, and um, I know I know for a fact some dudes got shot up because yep. I I saw them yep. afterwards. Yep. But damn, that's in in only one only one KIA through and entire that was, Canadian Special Operations. Um, yeah, I believe so. If there's something I'm forgetting, please forgive me. But like, I'm, I'm fairly sure, and that was the one I was just telling you about the, I guess it would have been Roto Zero in Iraq, and it's a seesaw guy. Um, and uh, that, that was it, man. Wow. And like, yeah, again, I just I knock on wood, because, yeah. you know, it's a fucking, it's a crazy, it's a crazy thing you're out there doing. It's um, been a long war. But yeah. And we are. Well, let's get into it. Blessed. <laughs> yes, you are. <clears throat> yeah. Let's get into the next deployment. Okay, so next point was uh, Roto number would have been Roto six. Uh, for this one, I, I went with four man sniper team. Uh, I was a two IC, a TL, and, and two number one and two. Um, most of the deployment was we were trying every step of the way to get into Mosul. So we had, from the first roto I was there, we were on a defensive line way back from, from Mosul. Um, and this one, we were we were trying to get in there. So the Iraqis um, and some pushes done previously had pushed ISIS back into Mosul. Um, and mainly uh, West Mosul. So there's a river that goes right in the middle. Um, and most of ISIS was pushed back there. Other than like, there's also some other tasks with, or in the cities going going to to look for people. Um, but the whole time, most of that roto, we go and do a few hits around the cities, and those were mainly like no one wanted to scrap. It's like you're in someone's house, with fucking panels in the middle of the night. They're like, yeah, okay, <laughs> I'm, I'll come with you. Uh, so none of that was very dynamic. It was fun, uh, but it wasn't anything really, uh, really no crazy. No engagements. Yeah. Um, uh, and then so so most of that road was that, but all of us really trying to press to get into Mosul. And uh, like our TL was just like he had his. As soon as we got there, he had his eye set on the, the Nineveh Hotel which was like, a, I think it was a nine-story hotel right on the river, west looking into East Mosul, where uh, where ISIS was like, that's that's where they were now holding. So the, the fight was kind of across the river. Are we getting into this already? That's, this is, yeah. This is, this is, this. <laughs> okay. okay. So what? <laughs> yeah. So I actually, I'll talk a little bit about, <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about uh, the workup. Like I mentioned it a bit. We went... We came back down to Texas again to train with accuracy first. Um, and we were starting to shoot like upwards of three kilometers. Um, we're kind of like the group of guys in that troop, fucking phenomenal, just always pushing, pushing, pushing. And we were there and we got this piece of kit and it's a company, man, I hope we get it right. It's TACCOM HQ, I think. And they make a prism. So previously, long shots were like you dial on a sniper scope and then you're holding in the reticle. So you'll be with the shooter spotter team. The shooter's not even looking at 
can't even be looking at the target. It's a different reference point, and then you're getting corrections off of that. Because in order to have the round go that far, like your, your gun is now required to point up in the air, essentially. So you can imagine if you're looking through a scope, you're looking high up on a building, higher up on an antenna, holding on a fucking cloud, like something like that, and just trying to get a correction. So what this prism did is it allowed us to have that angle, but also still see what you're aiming at. Okay. So we got like the first couple versions of it that were just like this piece of metal, <laughs> just like here's how you put it on. And we were playing with those. But what in, does it in look Texas. like? It goes in front of the scope, um, and they're like they have a company, and it's like they're they're getting them out there now. This was like the very I think some of the very first ones. It just attaches on the rail in front of your scope, and it's like whatever a prism does, whichever way it's angled, I don't know. Yeah. So that when you're pointed up, your the shooter's field of view still has the target in it. So what does it look like a like a UNS or something? Yeah, sort of like a UNS. Okay. Yeah, these were like very rough first prototype kind of things that we brought with us. Um, and it was just trying to piece together stuff so that we could reach out a little further and a little further. Is is this something you would keep on your rifle fixed all, all the time no, or very specific? No, it would be very specific okay. because you can't shoot someone at 100 meters with that on. Yeah. Like you won't be able to see them. I've, I've never, weird. Yeah, I don't have any experience with this. So yeah. fascinating. So it's like this prism thing comes and we're like, what the fuck? And so we're doing workup training. And I told, it's funny, our Sergeant Major's there and some other guys. And I was like, I promise you on this road, we're going to break the world record. So that <laughs> oh, workup man, training, really? the workup training in Texas. Now it sounds extremely cocky. I get it. And then my Sergeant Major's like, what? It's like, I fucking, I'm telling you, from the last time we were there, I know where we're going. It's like, I promise we will break the world record on this deployment. Did you know what the record was? Yeah, it was like uh, 24 something. Like, I can't, there was a Brit guy, I think, that had like 2,400 meters or something. You, do, you don't know him? No, I don't know well, him. I would love to get the two of you in here for an episode together, <laughs> but, uh, but no shit. So you knew the damn, you knew the world record. Yeah, it was like 2,400, but we were, we were punching past that very consistently with this prism now. And I was like, holy fuck. So that was before we deploy the first, and it was, I think it was, yes, just over six month tour. And most of it was just trying to get into that fight in Mosul. Um, we ended up getting into that hotel as an OP and it was kind of a weird, so the Iraqis were on like floor three or four and we were, ended up moving into an OP on the top floor, like floor nine, I think it was. Um, and it was just fucking weeks and weeks and weeks of just watching, just looking and watching and learning the ground. Um, we were waiting for an Iraqi push from the north to start clearing through the city uh, or the east east part of Mosul. And we were gonna support that like perpendicular. So we have high ground, we're perpendicular to the fight. The ground is sloping up and away. So it's like an absolutely perfect scenario for long range sniping. Like wow. you can see splash. You can't spot swirl at that, at that range because the fucking culmination point's so high, but it's just like this setup, we're like, holy fuck. But we were in there for, I think total, we were in there like 50 some days. And it would be not all at one go like a week, two weeks, go back to our bill, regroup. Like, are they gonna push? Oh, they might, we'll go back. And it was, I think 52 days is, it was around that time that, that we were. You guys were going back to the same OP? Yeah. That's ballsy. Yeah. That's really well, ballsy. Well, for the first, uh, for the first long while, all we were doing, like we had a, we had a loophole and we had another squadron that was with us. We would just be on the glass and then on the thermal night at night and just be gathering information on the town and then calling airstrikes. Okay. So like we weren't, there was nothing coming from that building from us. Gotcha. And they were used to getting shot at from the fourth floor. The Iraq is just like, oh, okay. or whatever. So it, it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't just you and no. a few guys hanging it out there. There wasn't there was a lot of heat. Like, it, it felt pretty safe, man, to be honest. Like, we got up to the top floor, cleaned it up, set it up, covered 
our roots in and out of where we were watching. And it wasn't like the building would take the odd round or mortar, but it like, I think it was more like, let's just keep everyone on the fucking west side on their toes and send you. something. Cause there was Iraqis like five floors below us. Um, yeah. So it was just like kind of not mundane, but just like OP routine. And I was like fucking flip flops every day, just looking at the spotting scope, listening to podcasts. But what it gave us was a super clear picture of everything in the city. Like everything was lazed. We, we knew the distance to fucking every building and like the corresponding dope, like, or the, the elevation holds and stuff to use. So it was like between that and how much we trained with communication between the sniper shooter team, like that's a, that's the deadliest combination of sniper skills, I think. Like everyone can learn to shoot a bolt action gun. It's really not that complicated if you have good ammo and a good weapon system. But like the communication and how fast and slick it got is what I think made like, because we, we supported that Iraqi push for like almost a week and it was like very effective, but it was because of, we knew everything. We're just like the corner of that building. We have a name for it. You knew where it was on it. Elevation, here's a wind call, send it. We'd be like, as soon as the round lands, if it's not a hit, here's your correction, send it. And like that support. Wow. It was, it was just so, it was so fucking cool to see the culmination of that sniper troop, what we learned in Texas, how much the guys cared and how much they pushed, how much they wanted it to like all come together. And it was like, it was, it was pretty slick at some ranges that were, man, I bet we broke the record between the four of us, the previous one, fucking five times that week. Are you serious? Yeah, like 2,400. So the longest shot, uh, like the, long, the 3540, the battle kind of came a little bit towards us each day up to maybe 2,100 meters. So like that week, all the engagements were from 3,540 meters to like two grand. So there oh, was like wow. a bunch of different shots, but we're like, well, fuck, we don't, we're not gonna say, now we got second place and third place and fourth place and fifth place. <laughs> Cause we're like, that was a long shot. We just were stunned, but I'll get into kind of how that was, but it was so, because the tour was kind of slow and there was one thing that happened that like, it almost fucking, it, it like changed my fucking drive. It like kicked me into overdrive. So there was this ISIS fighter that got uh, captured and they were doing a debrief. I can't remember if it was an intelligence debrief or a reporter or something I was talking to him. This goes back to like the human trafficking thing we were talking about downstairs earlier. And he was bragging about having raped like upwards of 200 young girls because there's a human trafficking sex trade on the battlefield, like the battlefield of Iraq. I, fuck man, I remember it being like, just so fucking disturbing, but also like next level rocket fuel for what I wanted to do. Like it was, it, like to me that's the uh, it's the worst fucking evil there is like if you're gonna fight for a cause and you're gonna kill you're gonna fight another war you're gonna fight you know guys are killing each other in a battle that that happens it's part of fucking history and everything is but like that specific getting that information i every time we fucking killed someone i was like that number 200 plus was in my head I'm like, that's 200 plus less that's going to happen tomorrow, starting today. Yeah. And it was like a fucking drive. I was so hungry. To, and this was like kind of my own internal purpose. I don't know if I, we talked a little bit about it and I don't know the drivers of, you know, why everyone's doing it. But for me, I was like, we...